Okay. All of our visitors, members, well wishers, haters. Just glad everybody's here is here. Amen. Well, if if you if you're hating me, maybe I can convince you to love the Lord. You don't have to love me. At least not till you get the Holy Ghost. Then you gotta love your enemies. Amen. So it's a little different after that. Amen. Uh, oh yes. Uh, in the book of First Samuel, let's just get right into the word. Book of First Samuel. And also in the book of Amos. Now I don't know what's going on with the electric. They may be fooling with something up the street for all I know. I don't know why it keeps popping and crackling. So yeah, just bear with it. I'm pretty sure it's not us. First Samuel, and just so that you know, um, the next book is the book of Amos. So this will give you an opportunity to look at your index in the front of your Bible and find what page it's on. But I can just let you know, the book of Amos really is there. If you find the book of Joel, you're almost there. You, you're close. First Samuel, chapter number 3, verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord and the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep. Uh, <clears throat> verse 4, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went, and he lay down. And the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Then in the book of Amos, chapter number 8, verses 11 and 12. Amos 8. Verses 11 and 12. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, <clears throat> but of the hearing of the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, and from north, from the north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro, and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. We'll just stop right there. I'd like to speak this morning from the subject, the word of the Lord is precious. Now, the word precious that I'm using is the same as the word precious used here in the book of 1 Samuel. Now, the word precious is found in the Bible prior to this chapter, but this is the first time this particular word is used in the Bible, precious. And it means rare. It's a rare thing. And so, just to give you a little background for those that don't know about Samuel, his mother desperately wanted a child. She could not have any children. She went to the Lord asking for the Lord to give her a child. And he did. And she promised him, if you give me a child, I'll give him to you. And so when she had her first child, Samuel, she 
took him after he had been weaned from her, and she took him to the temple and gave him to Eli to raise as his child in the service of the Lord. And so here is where we find where Samuel, as a child, is starting to, he's starting to be used by God, but he doesn't even know how God does things. The Bible says, now, the Lord has given us some background into this because he says the word of the Lord was precious in those days. The word of the Lord was rare because Eli was old, and I'm going to use our modern day terminology, but the Bible says it's slightly different. Eli was old and he was fat and he could not get around well. So Eli couldn't do the service of the Lord like it needed to be done. And the Bible says that his two sons were the sons of the devil. Those were some bad young men. They, they were lying carnally with women in the temple doorways. They, they were in the church desecrating the temple and there were some things that God had required of the priest one of which was the light was to never go out in the temple that's symbolic for us because the Holy Ghost is the light and without the Holy Ghost you have no light to shine on this we see people who go to college and they get degrees in theology. They go to uh, these Christian schools to learn what they can about the Bible. And I'm not trying to degrade that because they may learn the poetry of the Bible. They may learn how the sentence structures line up and what it should mean. But they don't truly understand what the Bible is saying if they don't have the Holy Ghost. That is very evident today. It is evident that you can have a woman that is not your wife get up out the bed with you in the morning and y'all go to church and enjoying Jesus. Hallelujah. You know why? Because they read what the Bible says, but they don't understand what the Bible means. And without the light, without the light shining on the word, you're not going to get it. Amen. I've said this before. Try reading a book in the dark and see how far you get. You can't do it. And you can't read this book in the dark. You have to have the Holy Ghost. You have to have someone with the Holy Ghost open the word to you. It says that, I think it was Eli, no, not Eli, um, Ezra said that he, he spoke the word and gave the sense. You can't just read the Bible. We could come to church, just read the Bible, and then go home. But you need somebody to give the sense of what it means. You can't just sit back and read it and say, ah, I got it. No, somebody has to tell you. What does that mean to me? How does that break down in my life? When Jesus came on the scene, he was taking things from the Old Testament and he was shedding light on what it means. He used parables to deceive those that would not listen and he used parables as a way for those who would listen to understand exactly what he was talking about. So a lot of his parables dealt with farmers sowing seed and things like that. All because he knew that at a natural level we could understand it. And if I could just say it this way. God was trying to give us a heavenly understanding with an earthly mind. You can't understand the things of heaven if you've never been to heaven. You just don't get it. I know people sit around, and I can't wait till I get up there, and I'm going to walk them streets of gold, you know, and I, I'm going to have all my slippers and my white robe. I can't wait till I got my wings. That ain't got nothing to do with it. No. Nothing at all. I'm not going to heaven to get a pair of wings. No. 
Amen. Unless Jesus came back with some wings, that's not what we're going to get. All right. I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave that alone. I'm getting off my subject. Amen. You can keep on singing about your slippers if you want to. The word of the Lord was rare in those days, and he tells us why. There was no open vision. God was not revealing himself any longer because Eli knew what his children were doing. He knew what his sons were doing, and he let them do it. The Bible says he did not restrain them. He did not pull them off of service to the temple. He allowed them to continue to pervert what was going on in the church. And so God began to withdraw himself. There was no open vision. God, And, and remember, the Bible says without a vision, the people perish. You've got to have a vision. And if God begins to shut his vision off, how can you live? But there was no open vision. And the Bible even goes a little bit further to describe the situation that Eli was in. It says his eyes began to wax dim. He couldn't see either. His eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And then we have the most tragic thing of all. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, the, lamp, the light, the light that was to shine on the word, the, the bread that was in there is the word. The bread that was in the temple represented the word of God. The light was the spirit that illuminates, that reveals to us what God is looking for. And yet, in the temple of the Lord, Samuel allowed the light to go out. How can you see without that? So he he's, dr drops one more tidbit in there, which is the ark of the Lord was there. This was a time when the ark was there. God, his dwelling place, the seat of God, where the mercy seat was, where when you did wrong, you could go and find mercy and help in the time of need. You could go to the priest and have him offer up a sacrifice so that you could get peace, so that you could get forgiveness from what you had done wrong. And Samuel's sons, they were so vile that the Bible said how that meat was to be cooked before the priest was to get their portion. And his sons went and told him, I won't have my meat boiled. I won't have my meat cooked. Give it to me now raw, and I'll fix it the way I want. And the people said, don't do this because God will be angry with me. God will not hear me because you have not offered up the sacrifice that I brought. You haven't offered it up the way God said to bring it. He said to burn the flesh first, to burn this meat, then whatever was left the priest could have. You've taken it before it's even offered. How will God hear me? Now this, this tells you a little bit about the condition of the church today. How can God hear when the preacher's not even right? You come to church to find out what thus saith the Lord and yet the lights are off. The temple where God is supposed to be, where the ark is, where the spirit of God comes to dwell, where we come to meet the Lord and hear what he has to tell us, where we come to be in his presence. And yet there's no light, there's no bread, there's nothing being given out. The priests are doing whatever they want to do. Samuel was young and sensitive he wanted to serve the Lord. He had been raised by his mother, a godly woman. She knew where to go when she, when she was in trouble. She went to the temple and was crying out to the Lord, and God answered. She instills this in her child. And now Samuel is working for the priest. And when the Lord begins to speak, Samuel don't even realize that it's God talking to him. Verse 7, it says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. He didn't know God was even talking to him, but God was talking to him. All right. that's, I think that's something important for us to understand because there are times when God is dealing with us and we just kind of brush him off and ignore it. Right. Right. But when you're young in the Lord, when you 
are just newly saved, you don't even realize when God is talking to you. He was new to this thing. Samuel was fresh in the church. He hadn't been there very long and God is talking to him. Samuel didn't even realize God is speaking to me right now. How many times? Three times God had to call him before Samuel realized this is God talking to me. Now what's really crazy is it was Eli that recognized in all his wrongdoing, in all his slowfulness, in, in his attitude of not changing his sons, in his attitude of not fixing things in the church, he still recognized that God was talking to this young man and told him the next time God speaks, say, here am I, thy servant, here. Now, remember this. The first time God called him, he said, here am I. And God never said nothing back. He jumped up and ran to Samuel. It wasn't until Samuel told him, in all of his crookedness, Samuel told him, but that's the Lord talking. Here's what you say the next time God speaks to you. I just want you to know there are times when we find ourselves in situations. I, I don't know. We have people that are in the military. They may not be around where they can get to a church that has some good preaching. Or you might be someplace where you just aren't, you don't really have that access to the word like you really want all the time. Sometimes we can learn something from somebody crooked. Somebody not trying to serve the Lord. Somebody not doing right. We might learn something from them. And I'm not saying to go out and just find somebody crooked and say, well, you know, the preacher said you can learn from crooked people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying God can use somebody that's crooked. Somebody that's not trying to do right. Somebody that's not living what they know to be true. God can use them to reveal himself to you. We are living in this day where the word of the Lord is precious. You turn the radio on, you don't hear people preaching about the Lord. Turn on the television, these preachers ain't talking about God. They're not trying to reveal something from the word of the Lord. What they're doing is, and if you buy my book for 1995, there's a lot of good things that you can learn about the Lord in my book. Amen. The only books that you need is these 66 books right here. You need these 66 books, the Holy Ghost, and somebody to give you the sense of what this is talking about. That's all you really need. But if you listen to these preachers, they got radio broadcasts. They got CDs and DVDs you can buy, books that you can buy. Most of their programs, I, I turned them on, and quite honestly, it was like torturing myself. And I'm not just saying that. I sat and listened for a while. Their half an hour show ain't got nothing to do with the Bible. It's 15 minutes of encouragement and then 15 minutes of buy my products. Word of the Lord is precious. People don't want to know what the Bible says like they used to anymore. I'm, I'm shocked myself at how many times I talk to people and they get offended now if I quote scriptures to them. Mm, is right. Yes. Mm. Hallelujah. I, I'll quote scriptures and they'll get upset with me. Well, what does this do? Uh, this has happened in my life. What should I do? And I said, well, the Bible says, let's open up the Bible. Let's go over here and we'll read it and I'll read the scripture. I'll tell them, what? I'm not joking. What? That ain't right. That's not fair. Why would God say that? I said, I don't know why God said it. All I know is what he said. All I can tell you is what it says. Get mad at me and walk on out. Walk out mad as they was when they come in. Some of them walk out madder than when they come in. Not at, not at me because I told them what they didn't want to hear. They mad because I quoted something from the Bible they didn't want to hear. Amen. That sister pushed me and knocked me down. And, and I, I haven't spoke to her in seven months because I'm still mad at her. I can still feel my arm is sore right here. And I said, well, but here, now the Bible says, love your enemy. What? What do you mean? I didn't push them first. They pushed me. Mad at me now because I quoted the scripture. You know why? Because the word of the Lord is precious. Now, people don't want to know what God says about things. Matter of fact, in the book of Amos, he goes on and he said, the days are coming where there's going to be a famine for the word of the Lord, where people will run to and fro. They're going to go here and there looking for truth, but not being able to find the truth. 
the words of the Lord are going to be something that people are willing to travel from sea to sea to get. Oh, yes. We've got folks that come from over in England and from France and Germany, from Holland. They'll come over here to hear these preachers. Man, I'm flying to the United States, and I'm going to listen to Bishop Johnson. He's got a word from the Lord. And I know that if I don't get over at least once in my lifetime and see him in person, that I haven't really done what God wanted me to do. I'm going looking for something special from sea to sea. Looking for the word of the Lord. And you know what they're getting? Nothing. The pot is empty. The preacher's standing there cooking. He got the pot. And he's just digging in and bringing up nothing and putting it on the plate. And people walking away. Woo, I'm full. Not getting anything from the Lord. The word of the Lord is precious today. Amen. He says... They shall go to and fro, north to east, sea to sea, and shall not find it. You know why? Because they're looking everywhere but where they're supposed to look. All you have to do is go down to your local bookstore, get you $50 out your pocket, go in there and buy you a nice Bible. It's worth 200 I would have paid 500 for the Bible. I would have paid more than that if I had to borrow it. I'm willing to go to the bank and take out a loan and get something that will take me here and there. And let me tell you, I paid six years for my car. Six years for that thing. I ain't letting it go. I paid a whole lot of money for that car, and I don't understand. Now, now I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I don't understand. You spend $30,000 on a car. As soon as you pay it off, you go get thirty more thousand dollars for another car. I don't do that. Now, that's me because the money... And my account is precious. I can't afford to do that like some folks do. Man, maybe if I was rich as some people, I, I could do that. But I'm willing to go take a loan out from the bank and pay five years for it just so I can have transportation. And then we'll turn around and say, I don't have a Bible. It's $79. Are you kidding me? I'm not. Oh, I don't have that kind of money. Go borrow money. But you know what? The word of the Lord is precious. It's rare these days. People not only get Bibles and just leave them laying around like they're good luck charms. Here, let me. Yes. Put that on my coffee table at home because, you know, I want people to know this is a Christian home. Well, you don't have to have a Bible out for people to know that you got a Christian home. Just go get all your bottles of liquor, throw them away. Go back into your bedroom, take, reach into your top dresser drawer under your underwear and pull your blue bag of weed out and go throw it in the garbage. Go get all the medicine bottles in your medicine cabinet that's got your mama and your auntie's name on them. Take them and dump them in the toilet stool. Reach underneath your mattress Grab them magazines that ain't got no business being there. Take your computer that's on the internet that's taking you to all these websites you ain't got no business being on. Take that computer, throw it in the garbage and say, my eye is offending me. Pluck it out. Then people will begin to realize, you know what, this house is different than some of these other homes I'm going into. I don't see all that crazy stuff in their house. You don't have to have no good luck Bibles. You don't have to have some cross hanging on the wall big enough to hang you so people know that you are Christian. You don't have to go through all that. Just live a holy life. Walk up right before the Lord. Make sure that the word of the Lord is not precious in your home, in your life in your family's life. Make sure that y'all holding on to the truth of God's word. You don't have to go from the north to the east. You don't have to do that. You don't have to go here and there, to and fro. You don't have to search for it. Go to church and just listen to what the preacher's saying. That was prophecy. Behold, the days cometh. That those days are here right now. There is a famine for the word of the Lord. 
Hey man, you know, people quote all kind of stuff. They ain't quoting scriptures. You look at them, some of them got t-shirts. They'll have little Bible slogans on their t-shirts. They don't know what it means. Bumper stickers on their car. They don't understand what that scripture means. Get on Facebook. Everybody trying to be saved got all, every day five or six scriptures. Ain't living none of it. All right, all right. All right. I'm not telling you to cut your Facebook off. Amen. I'm just saying don't get on there trying to prove you saved. I can guarantee you this. Unless I've been hacked, you can get on my Facebook page and there's not going to be one single thing inappropriate on there. Nothing. And I haven't deleted things off. I haven't gone in. You know what? I, I make a very conscious effort when I get on there. Very conscious effort. When I get on there to make sure that what I say is not inappropriate. I'm not calling nobody out. I'm not saying nothing nasty about anybody. I'm not trying to preach to folks on Facebook because that's not church. <clears throat> Facebook is not church, y'all. You're not saving people by setting them straight on Facebook. Amen. Oh, I got some amens, and I know there's some folks in here on Facebook. Hallelujah. You're not going to save anybody like that. And so I get on there and I, I might talk about how bad traffic was. But there's nothing inappropriate about bad traffic unless you're sitting in it. The word of the Lord is precious. And if you're not sure you're hearing from God, keep coming to church and keep studying his word. After a while, you'll realize, oh, that's the Lord talking. Come ask me. I can tell you. You know how I know when it's the Lord and it's not the Lord? Because when it's the Lord, it does not ever contradict this. Never. If you come to me and say, the Lord is telling me I need to fast. Well, okay. That don't contradict the Bible. What you fasting for? Well, I'm fasting because I want some more money in my bank account. No, that's not the Lord. Just come and ask. I, 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 I'll, I'll help you. And you can be guaranteed this. It's not going to be my guess. We'll go straight to the Bible. I'll show you where it says it in there and where it doesn't say it. Amen? Amen. amen. All right. Now, y'all said amen. amen. Don't get mad at me when I read it to you. Yeah, amen. You come in there. Well, I don't know. I heard someone say, somebody called him and said, well, you know, um, my, my wife and I started a business and um, we just missing church. What should we do? You don't have to ask about that. You know what to do. Quit your business and go get a job somewhere. Go back to McDonald's or wherever it was you came from originally. Get that job back and keep coming to church. Now, the Lord didn't tell you to do something like that. Amen, y'all. God doesn't tell you to contradict the Bible. And if you're not sure, come ask and we'll go through the word. Piece by piece, line by line. Here a little, there a little. Precept upon precept. We'll go through it and line it all up so that you are satisfied when you walk away. That is not the Lord. Or that is the Lord. Amen. Amen. Take advantage of the tools that you have. And remember this. Today, the word of the Lord is precious. Stop running around asking everybody what you think I ought to do. They don't have the word of the Lord. Go someplace, go to somebody, go to someone that has the word of the Lord and get your information there. If your answer is not from the Bible, I'm not interested in your answer. There's not a situation that we face in life that the answer cannot be found here somewhere. If I don't know it, I'll tell you. I don't know, but I'm going to find out. I'll go ask. I'll ask somebody that I know knows. And then I'll come back with my scriptures lined up. Amen. Amen. Don't let the word of the Lord be precious in your life. It's precious in the world. It's precious in a lot of churches. But you don't have to let it be precious in your life. Even when it hurts, hold on to the word. I was thinking this morning how when I first got the Holy Ghost, 
I never saw anybody get angry because of the word. They got their feelings hurt. They may have walked away and said, I didn't know the Bible said that, but I'm going to have to do it. They did that. I never heard anybody get up and say, well, why would God say that? I don't get it. What does he mean by that? I just don't understand. Why would God tell me to bless somebody that's cursing me? I never heard anybody do that until these days. But that's because people don't want the Bible. They want to feel good. They want to walk away saying, mm -hmm, even the preacher said I should have punched him. Let them come back up again and say that to me one more time. And I'm going to do what the pastor said. And, and then look, and then when they go to jail, be telling everybody, yeah, my pastor told me to punch them, and I did. I've heard preachers do that. I had a pastor tell me one time, man, you ain't got to take that. I didn't want to argue with my pastor. I walked away and said, yes, I do. The Bible says I do. I got to take it. I didn't listen to that foolishness, but I knew the Bible said something different. Had I listened to what he said, I'd have been in all kind of trouble. Man, you ain't got to take that. Well, are you going to pay my bills when I get fired? Come on now. No, I took it. Kept my job too. Ended up changing the boss. Amen. I did. So, yeah, there's some things we just got to do. Stick with this. And don't let the word of the Lord be precious to you. Amen. Amen. Amen.